Some people claim that to be an emergency communicator, you need a bunch of fancy gear. Wrong. Today on Radio KD8TTE, we're going to present What Can I Do With an HT and a Technician License? Stick around. Black one, black one. Emergency communication is a very broad topic. Generally, what it means is resilient. It does not mean any specific capability. It does require cooperation that is being part of a system. So let's start with a quick review of the typical HT, the handy talkie. We have uh, 2 meters, 70 centimeters are the common bands. That's 144 megahertz or 440 megahertz. Uh, it's typically using frequency modulation. They're capable of performing splits of squelching with subaudible tones or digital codes. It's going to be low power and probably has even lower power settings. It does have a removable battery and also it will have a removable antenna. So the bottom line is that what we have with this kind of gear is something that is very flexible, it's very configurable, and very, very portable. So let's take a look at the implications to be able to see what that means we can do, rather than focusing on what we can't. So first of all, with frequency modulation FM, we're going to get generally good audio as long as we are close enough to be heard. That is going to be a relatively short distance, especially if we are working with the small antennas, the type that come with the devices. We are going to be able to run for long periods of time thanks to the batteries being easy to remove and we can actually just you know stack them all up and switch uh, as we need during the course of an operation. Because it is so highly portable, it also means that we have the ability to relocate very easily if we have a need during the course of an operation. The removable antenna also means that we can plug in another antenna which will improve significantly our distance and with the splits and the squelch options we have the ability to work through automated repeater systems. Earlier we looked at how to serve your community in Radio KD8 TTE episode 42. We talked about weather spotters working in the Skywarn program, damage assessment, flood fight operations that might be done by Community Emergency Response Teams, or CERT. We talked about stations at incident command posts where they might originate, deliver, and relay messages including the ICS 213 general message and then a station that could operate at a shelter or some other location where there could be a need for members of the public to communicate with friends and family. And that can be using the National Traffic System, NTS, to ensure that even when the circuits are not there for direct communication, a message can still be relayed effectively. Now these are not easy tasks that mean you don't need training. All of these operations require an understanding of how to work as part of a net. The net may be directed or free, but an emergency operation is different from recreational operation. It's not a rag chew. So whether formal messages for relay or point-to-point -point abbreviated procedure origination is important, you got to write a good message you need to write concisely, clearly, and that will not require a lot of back and forth to make sure that you are understood. Some people don't train because they say they already know how to do something. That's just bogus. They won't prove it with action, then they're just bluffing. It's also bogus for a second reason, and that is if they really do know how to do it, they need to be out there showing other people how to do it to help the ranks of the amateurs who are capable to grow. Procedures will develop over time, and that means that if they're not actively participating, they're also going to be falling behind. Finally, these are also perishable skills. You have three options. You can practice a lot to develop, you can practice regularly to maintain, or you can atrophy. Those are the only options you have when it comes to operation. I will take a couple of practiced HT operators over a dozen highly capable stations with operators who do not practice. 
So today we're going to focus on what the technician with an HT can do, and as usual here, we're going to focus on execution to show how it works. Let's take a look at the Brass Rose exercise that was conducted in November of 2016 in support of Franklin County Emergency Management and Homeland Security in Ohio. The Auxiliary Communications OXCOM team was developing there, drawing from Franklin County Amateur Radio Emergency Service, ARIES, the Central Ohio Traffic Net, an NTS affiliate, and the Franklin County Community Emergency Response Team, CERT. We're going to simplify some of the details so that we can focus on the model and the use of some HT-only operators at incident command posts and using a more capable incident command post to support them in maintaining contact with area command. So our scenario calls for strong storms, including an EF4 tornado that have come through central Ohio, taking out power, communication lines, and repeaters for mobile phones, marks, and other radio services. Marks is the multi-agency radio communication system, a P25 communication service that is run throughout the state for public safety. CERT volunteers are conducting light search and rescue operations at three locations in the county. Area Command is in the process of being established at Franklin County Emergency Management and Homeland Security. There are three objectives for the exercise. One is to establish communications for area command with three active ICPs or incident command posts. Two, to receive an ARRL radiogram for delivery from each ICP by voice. And three, to receive ICS-213 formatted situation reports or SITREPs from each ICP with the FL message application. Wait, why a radiogram from an ICP? Well don't fight the exercise. That's an enormous problem that we have with exercises, not only with amateur operators, but even with professionals. There is a tendency to fight an exercise. Don't do it. As a player, you don't know why an objective is in place, and most likely the people who are planning have a much bigger picture than you have. So the skill set, as it turns out in this case, was part of a improvement plan that had been created and this was an opportunity to incorporate that skill all by itself for integration with other skills at a later time. That's the reason in this case that skill was part of what was being tested through a singular objective. Alright, so the Brass Rose exercise was taking place in Franklin County, Ohio. In addition to myself, we had Chris Badley, KE8BBM, Matt Hughes, KD8VXK, and Terry Holdren, KD8YFW, participating on the radio. We were set up in four locations in particular, Franklin County Emergency Management and Homeland Security, which was acting as our, our headquarters, the Area Command. We also had an incident command post established in a neighborhood known as Old Town East in Columbus, another ICP that was set up in Bexley, and then further east there was an incident command post established at Whitehall. Now the distance that we're talking about for each of these ICPs to be able to talk to area command was between 7 and 9 miles. So it's not a very long distance, but it's just long enough to make things interesting. In addition, the way that the uh, damage path was for the purpose of the exercise and where the ICPs had to be located, they were closer to each other than they were to area command. This is also not necessarily unrealistic. So in the case of the distance between Old Town East and Bexley, we're talking about uh, just under 2.6 miles, and the distance between uh, Bexley and Whitehall ICPs was under 3.5 miles. So how we're going to be able to make that kind of distance with radio communication and with the two meter band in particular uh, is a straightforward matter. 
The issue, of course, is whether we use an HT right out of the box or whether we need something more capable. In fact, at the station that was situated at Bexley, uh, we were using an antenna that gives us a few more options. A lot of people will use something like this and will get a, a magnetic mount unit that will assemble with this for the purpose of being able to put it on their car. It works very effectively that way. However, in this particular case, we're not operating mobile. We are setting up an incident command post. So in that case, we were able to use a different mount rather than the magnetic mount, we were able to use a bracket mount to attach it to the top of a mast, and that assembly includes the radials necessary to establish a ground plane, which will improve significantly the performance of that antenna if it's put on top of a mast. Now this mast in particular, it's up at 28 feet. So it's able to support a dipole there at 20 feet, you're able to see, and the ground plane for VHF and UHF is at 28 feet. How are we going to be able to perform? Well, if we do a little bit of homework, we're able to see that there have been publications about this, and I'll include links, of course, below. Uh, one of them in particular deals with how far I can go on two meters, and it looks at various configurations. Two things are going to matter. Number one is power, and number two, even more important, is going to be about how much height you get. And that is going to become very significant as we look at this situation. So we've got a table from this article that we're able to look at. And there's a whole bunch of data. It becomes easy to get confused. But if we look closely, we focus on the particular situation that we're dealing with. We have a Comet antenna that advertises a 3.8 decibel gain on 2 meters. Our mast is 28 feet up, which brings us to a particular point that we're able to see what kind of distance we should expect. Well, if we're able to get 28 miles with a configuration similar to what we are using, then suddenly an HT with 5 watts seems much more viable for maintaining communication over a distance of 7 to 9 miles. The reason it seems more viable is because, in fact, it is. I'll show you another option just real quick here, a field expedient directional antenna. Uh, here we've got something that's a simple uh, system that can roll right up. It'll include the feed line, and I just roll it up in a blanket, and I include all the necessary gear right there. Open it up, and you get a Yagi Uda-style antenna from Elk. It comes in pieces. It's not just easy to transport, but it's super easy to assemble as well. You just match up the color-coded elements with the parts where they all screw together. So even if you don't understand the Yagi antenna, how it works, or even what it should look like when it's assembled, it's very easy to get it right, which is important for an operator who might be working in conditions that are stressful or if they're tired. So to get the antenna up high, we can put it on the field expedient mast or a painter's pole maybe that we lash against a downspout or something just to get it up over the top of the building. And of course, with the Yagi Uda antenna, it's important that we point it in the right direction because it has a tremendous amount of directionality. What that means is that we get much higher gain in one direction, but we lose a gain significantly to the sides. So in looking at options like this, it's important for us to think about our use case. What are we trying to do? If we are using the Yagi, we can reach further in the direction that we're pointed. But what does that mean? Well, if this is your area of operation, we've got four stations and you're trying to get up and running. If we've got an option like the Yagi and we point it from Old Town East to the East, we can cover Bexley and we can cover Whitehall, but the EMA is going to be on the side where we have a significant uh, reduction in gain. We're not going to be able to hear them. They're not going to be able to hear us, most likely. So if we point up to the EMA, that's great, but then we lose the ability to work with the other stations. So in this particular configuration, let's take a look at what our option is if we're using the vertical antenna. 
Again, that vertical has over 3 decibel gain, and it's almost 30 feet up. 5 watts will give us a range of 28 miles, assuming, of course, line of sight. Uh, if we have a big hill in the middle, we're not going to be able to fix that with a directional or more power anyway. When we're talking about VHF and UHF, it's just going to be height and power. So as long as we've got the ability to uh, see the target, if we've got line of sight, we're going to be able to get there very easily with an omnidirectional pattern. No need for the Yagi. Choose the antenna that's going to make sense. So what does all of this take for us to get these ICP stations up and running so that they have the ability to work this entire range? It's straightforward. We can use an HT. We use batteries and extra batteries, of course. We're going to make sure that we have the antenna with the mounting brackets with the radial and also a feed line that's going to be able to connect that antenna almost 30 feet in the air uh, to the HT that we are using at the ICP. That mast is going to be made up of aluminum or fiberglass poles that are used as military tent systems are fantastic for this purpose. And then, of course, we're going to want to use some 550 or similar kind of paracord to guide the mast and make sure that it stays put even if things get windy. We can also add digital to the mix by using the narrowband emergency messaging software, the NBEMS package, FL Digi, FL Message. And if we're using uh, an Android device, uh, we can use and FL Message. Uh, that is one app that is going to perform the functions of FL Digi as well as FL Message. And it can work in the field very simply. More important than any of this gear is going to be practice. The gear does us no good if we are not skilled in using it. So let's take a look at the exercise, how we're progressing. We have an inject of conditions. That is going to be that Area Command has two-way contact with the Bexley ICP. That's great. We add to it that Old Town East and Whitehall have good two-way connection to the Bexley ICP, but they have very poor two-way contact with each other. Also, they do not have the ability to reach up to Area Command. With this condition, the structure of the net is able to form for the purpose of uh, addressing the needs of the operation in the conditions that they find themselves. Bexley assumes net control and relay functions. And now we can see how it can be very useful for us to have more than one radio operator at a location. If we've got two at Bexley, one can be working inside of the communications unit for the purpose of supporting the Bexley operation, while the other one is performing the services of net control and relay for the other ICPs to ensure that everybody who is a part of this uh, organized operation can communicate effectively. So how did we do with respect to messages? Well, we were, in fact, able to get uh, the ARRL message to go through. Uh, for the purpose of making that work, we actually addressed a message to uh, the new uh, director of Franklin County Emergency Management and Homeland Security. Uh, conveniently, it was his first day, so we could send him a nice welcome message. And then we also had a series of situation reports and other information in the form of the ICS-213 coming from the various ICPs and going up to Area Command. So this brings us to a statement that I heard at the ARRL National Convention, which started me on the path of creating this video. The statement was that the operator with an HT and a technician license just isn't very useful in an emergency. As we were able to show in our 2016 exercise, this is just bogus. So let's modify that statement a little bit so that it's not so bogus. The operator with an HT and a technician ticket can serve a few ways in an emergency. To do so, you've got to learn your part. Understand that you are a part of a system. Your station has a small footprint, which means that it makes you a terminal, the beginning or the end of something. You're going to be relying on repeaters and relay stations in this mode. 
So what that means is that you need to get comfortable with net procedure, not only working as a station in the net, but also operating as net control, being able to operate as a relay station or performing other duties as net control might assign. You also need to get good at messaging. That is to say, origination, being able to create a message on behalf of the agency or the person that you are serving at your location and getting it relayed off of that site to one of those stations supporting you who has the ability to reach one of the systems necessary to make that message get where it needs to go. Conversely, you also need to be able to receive those messages that are coming in from elsewhere and to perform the function of delivery. All of these things require training and they require practice. It must be regular practice if you're going to use those skills effectively. So now plan your equipment upgrades by looking at parts that are going to work together. The antenna, as we described, is just not going to work very well if it's a small rubber duck. So get another one. You know you're going to need to get one. So what are you going to get? Should you just get a bigger whip antenna? Well, that might make sense. It's going to give you a lot more uh, capability. However, it's still going to be low to the ground unless you're standing up on a hill or something. Uh, maybe a vertical uh, that has the ability to connect to a magnetic mount that you put on your car would make sense. Uh, but if you have something that is separate from the mag mount itself, it might give you some useful options down the road like what we saw in our operation. Your batteries... You're going to want to get more than one. You're going to want to have a group of them, and you're going to want to work your way through them. Make sure that they're all being maintained, that they're all being regularly charged and discharged as you are using your gear and doing so regularly. Later, you can revisit that antenna. And when you revisit the antenna, you can take a look at things like a mast, a cord to guide the mast, a bracket mount that you're going to be able to put on top of the mast, the radials that you need and the feed line to be able to connect it to the HT. Now, at this point, you have the ability not only to work as one of the ICPs like we saw at Old Town East or at Whitehall, but you could also perform the functions that were being handled at the Bexley ICP, that is net control, hearing, and being heard by everybody in the operation, as well as being able to relay messages because of your ability to hear and be heard. Of course, as you're looking at your equipment planning, you can think beyond the HT. Uh, you don't need to be an HT only operator forever. Uh, the mobile rigs that are available don't need to be expensive and you can get considerably more power if you are using those. If you've planned well, you can also use the same antenna systems that you've been using for the HT, which will give you some options. For example, you could use a whip on the HT at the same time that you're using the mast and uh, some larger antenna that you've got on top of it. You can also go digital. You can use the X25 packet, and that could get you into things like the Winlink uh, global radio email system. With practice and with a skill that you develop by integrating all of these things together, you are going to be able to play an increasingly large part in emergency operations. You are going to be rather than the one who needs to be supported all the time to being the one who is able to support others. Gear without skill and experience won't get the job done. Gear when integrated into an operation by someone who is experienced and someone who is practiced is going to be much more effective. So the technician with an HT can play a very useful and important part in emergency. It's part of a system, more mobile than others, but it must be supported. If you're in that condition, take time to get more gear. It's going to be a while, but that's good. It gives you time to practice with what you have. You will need to practice as you would operate in those emergency conditions. And those are not necessarily just going to fall into your lap. You want to make that opportunity. Find others who are interested in developing and maintaining these skills. And you can make that opportunity for yourself. Meanwhile, you can report into your Aries nets uh, and others in your area. And if it isn't 
often enough, then again, you can make the opportunity talking to your net manager, talking to your emergency coordinator is going to give you some idea of who's interested and how you can make things work in a way that is going to be realistic. But in any case, make sure that you train with or without their support. You also want to make sure that you are reporting into the national traffic system nets that you can work. Do this regularly. As an HT operator, you need that system. So that's a system that you're going to have to work regularly to be able to use it effectively. Keep an eye on your future operation, of course. Gain skill, gain experience, and be able to acquire gear to advance so that you are the one supporting others. These are all subjects for future videos, so share this one, hit the like button, and subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any future training. Check the video description for links, send questions and comments, we're happy to engage. This is Radio KD8TTE, out.